Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves. I'm your host, Ike. And before you get too sucked into this awesome interview, do us both a favor. Like, subscribe, and share this amazing piece of entertainment, because I am here with the one, the only, Daniel Wong! Hey everyone, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are things in your neck of the woods, my guy? Also doing pretty great. Uh, just moved to a new place in San Francisco and really enjoying it here. So sweet. Got any sweet restaurants about that you are happy to visit soon or have already visited? Uh, one that's pretty cool is called Kura Sushi. It's this like conveyor belt sushi place. Uh, where oh, nice. They, yeah. yeah, they deliver the stuff on this like moving conveyor belt. It's really cool. And once you get like 15 plates, they give you a little toy, which is nice if you have kids or just enjoy little toys. <laughs> Do you have to get 15 plates all in one sitting or can you come there three times to get five plates? Uh, I think it's all in one sitting, but, you know, it's across uh, all of the people in your party. So, like, uh, you come there with so friends. You have to have and friends would be fat. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That works, too. If you just eat a lot. <laughs> that's awesome yeah there's a place like that near me as well but i don't have friends they don't have toys and i'm kind of medium on sushi so i haven't i haven't gone uh, in yet yeah not the greatest combination right. for getting toys from sushi places <laughs> yeah exactly all right my guy i've got a i've got an age-old question for you what is your favorite dad joke all right this one's actually a series of jokes uh what do you Ooh. call a cow with no legs I don't know. Ground what? beef. Nah. What do you call a cow with one leg? Hold on. One. Uno beef. I don't know. What? Steak. Uh, what do you call a cow with two legs? I don't know. What? Lean beef. Oh, because it has to lean like a fence. Okay. What do you call a cow with three legs? Oh, wait, hold on. Three. Like a triangle, tricycle, tri-tip? Tri-tip. Yeah, there we go. Hey, I got what one. Do you, what do you call a cow with four legs? Uh, a forcep? It's a cow. No, oh, should have seen it coming. <laughs> Do you have a favorite underutilized word in the uh, old English lexicon? Uh, I do, actually. It's ubiquitous. Not that the word is ubiquitous. It's not. But the word is literally ubiquitous. <laughs> uh, is ubiquitous learned... ubiquitous? Uh, if people were using it more, it would be. But unfortunately, no. <laughs> ubiquitous is, in fact, not ubiquitous. I actually learned this one from a physics teacher in high school who, for some reason, she had a uh, a vocab book for SAT words that used the vocab words in Yo Mama jokes. So the Yo Mama <laughs> joke was... Uh, so the kids would Mama... remember them more. <laughs> yeah, so that the kids could remember them more. They are basically just other Yo Mama jokes, but with SAT words. But yeah, this one was, <laughs> Yo Mama's so ubiquitous. When she sits around the house, she sits around the house. i'm really i'm really hopeful and also slightly worried for the american literacy that every kid that left that class minus you apparently walked around has been like man you gotta stop eating so much otherwise you're gonna end up to be ubiquitous (laughs) (laughs) uh daniel what is your biggest everyday temptation Ooh, my biggest everyday temptation, probably chocolate. Uh, Yeah, chocolate's just always so delicious. Uh, I try to limit myself because obviously eating too much is a bad thing. But, you know, there's all these studies that say (laughs) a little bit of dark chocolate is good for you. So who am I to disagree with these studies? Exactly. Are you a dark chocolate or milk chocolate guy? Definitely dark chocolate. Was this because of the study and you're like... You're kind of excusing it like red wine at dinner or were you a dark chocolate guy through and through well before getting this sweet intel? 
Uh, it's definitely not related to the studies. It is basically just, I feel like, you know, dark chocolate has a nicer complexity that can go better with flavors like caramel or sea salt or whatever. Milk chocolate's mm-hmm. like pretty good too. I, I'm never going to say no to chocolate, but I think dark chocolate is just uh, better on its own and better with other stuff. Yeah, you know, milk chocolate's like pop music and dark chocolate's like grunge. Yeah. It's got a little bit more character. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Do you... It, it, this is a complete sidebar. When it comes to coffee, how do you take your coffee? Or do you take mm. coffee? I guess I should start by asking. Yeah, this one is interesting because coffee is actually too bitter for me. Uh, so I'm more oh, of a fascinating. tea guy. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, nice green tea for me. <laughs> Arizona acceptable or is that too too much what the cool kids are doing? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's fine. Again, I'm not one to say <laughs> no to tea. <laughs> Is there a movie that you will never skip when channel surfing? Ooh. Uh, let's see. That's a really good question. I think Scott Pilgrim versus the world is definitely my favorite. Oh, yeah. Vir- yeah. Virtual hugs are being sent your way, my guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. I don't think I've so ever, I don't think I've ever pressed pause or not pressed play when seeing that, you know, on Netflix mm-hmm. or YouTube or like that. I, I can't not. It's all timer. Yeah. It feels like a timeless classic, you know? Oh yeah, and the the amount of Easter eggs you see in the background, the pacing of it, it just it it never it never relents and never doesn't, you know, I, I guess it never mm-hmm. disappoints, not never doesn't disappoint, <laughs> which is hard. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. It's a great movie. <laughs> Growing up, what was your favorite book? Oh, my favorite book, man! I didn't really like reading when I was a kid, so probably just like Harry Potter. Hmm. Same Z's. Yeah. It's when did you first get exposed to Harry Potter? Uh, let's see. The first time I remember it, there were already three books out and it was at some point in elementary school, maybe like second or third grade ish. Um, but yeah, I, I thought it was a trilogy because at that point I didn't understand <laughs> the concept of, you know, an incomplete work where part of it yeah, has been published exactly. and part of it wasn't. So I was really surprised when it's like, oh, okay, you know, the first book is the first year. Wait, and there's seven years and there's three books. <laughs> it's just something here didn't add up. You were worried that Harry Potter was going to die in the third book or something like that. <laughs> yeah, like what's going to happen to him? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's kind of interesting. How how old are you, Danny? I'm 28. Okay, that's interesting. As I... I'm 34 and I remember I had the exact same experience. I remember picking up, I think it was in no, it couldn't have been third grade. I, okay. I guess it must've been later, but I remember when I first started reading the books, I read the first one. I think there was either there was at least two out, maybe three. And I remember having the same kind of thing. I didn't. And looking back, I really don't think I knew at the time of the idea of a, you know, work still in production the idea of you know mm-hmm. it not being done because like the only things i had read or like heard about up until that point were like you know lord of the rings and the hobbit and so like that these yeah. completed works that was like oh okay you know or uh there's some dragon series that i read growing up but it was like they're already done all these authors are old there's the idea of like new work coming out the only thing that even approach that idea was like captain underpants or something like that. And it was just like, <laughs> Oh, it, it, it was so silly. You didn't put it in the same kind of sphere in your brain as like Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. would. Yeah. It definitely felt like Harry Potter was one of those kind of, you know, classic Lord of the Rings type things. And I definitely didn't realize that like, Oh, the author is still writing these. <laughs> yeah. This is happening in my lifetime. <laughs> This is crazy. Yeah, it's the idea that like the things that happened in history books actually happen in real life. And what's happening now is going to be in history books in the future. (laughs) That's crazy. With way more video evidence and less likely to be embellished. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. That's my my favorite thing is looking back. It's like, I would love to have a time machine to look at some of the battles over history's, you know, great battlefields and like, were there actually a hundred thousand people there? Cause that's kind of surprising back in the year one, when it feels like there might've been a million people on the globe tops. And they're like, Oh yeah, it was a hundred thousand people versus 200. It's like, really? 
Did they bring their dogs? Like, what are you talking about? How is there well, that many like people there? It felt like to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. No, like, that's exactly what it was. It's like, guys like, yeah, he's just ballparking it. He's like, what's a good number? <laughs> like 100,000. Sweet. That's how many people there are. <laughs> yeah. All right. God forbid, if you had to evacuate your house, what's the first non-living thing you would grab and secure to safety? Oh, man. Um, probably one of my magic decks. Uh, this one in particular, it's not that it's just valuable. It is valuable. There are money magic cards out there, and they are in this deck. But also uh, because it has a lot of sentimental value. This is uh, basically a pet deck, a deck that I've been playing for a very long time. It's called Taking Turns for you magic nerds out there. <laughs> yeah, if if every if any magic nerd is watching or listening to this podcast and didn't realize that, shame on you. Sl- slap on the wrist. This is Daniel Wong we're talking to. Uh, known in some you still spheres have it, as the quad sleeve have it, guy. Yeah, I was going to say, I was like, is it still quad sleeved already yeah. to be shuffled in multiple piles? Yeah, although uh, I haven't really updated the deck for COVID, which is kind of unfortunate because some of the cards in it got banned. So can't play it as is for a modern tournament, but uh, it is still quad sleeved. Yeah. Nice. What comes to mind when I say the word underrated? Underrated. Man, there's a lot of things that I think are underrated. No visage popping into your mind. No word coming to the tongue. I I just feel like uh, people are really critical about a lot of things. And, you know, there's just really anything could be underrated. I feel like, I guess this isn't exactly underrated, but there are a couple of things that get a lot of undeserved hate, like uh, Hawaiian pizza or Nickelback. I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> necessarily say those things are underrated. They kind of have the camps of like love it and hate it. But mm-hmm. overall, they're like, you know, they're pretty fine. They're pretty decent. Pineapple on pizza yeah. is actually pretty okay. Oh, I'm a b- big fan. Big pineapple mm-hmm. lover over here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not a big fan of the Canadian bacon. It's not bad. I just think uh, pineapple, if any of you connoisseurs of the old pizza pie want to try this out pineapple and jalapeno oh wow a little sweet a little spicy get down tonight yeah my mouth is watering just thinking about that (laughs) what's your favorite industry secret or term that's only used in your line of work Ooh, that's a good one um so i'm a software developer Uh, i make a web app So one thing that sometimes happens is these like paywalls or, you know, a thing that asks you to log in before you can see more. And sometimes Mm -hmm. you can just open the developer tools in your browser and literally delete the things that are blocking your view. (laughs) And then you can get to that, you know, article or whatever it is underneath that you wanted to read. Are we going to have to blur out your face and name when we uh, publish this podcast? Is that (laughs) super secret intel that's going to... You know, is uh, it, is this the deep throat <laughs> interview uh, equivalency? I'm not gonna, I can name any websites where I've used this, but I definitely have <laughs> used this on certain websites and it does work sometimes. So do you work for a company that makes web apps or do you work for a company and make web apps for the company? Uh, we make a specific web app that's actually targeted for lawyers. So part uh, of- do you want to do you, do you want a free sponsorship moment? brief sponsorship moment what, sure what, what, uh, what company the company is called everlaw uh we work in the legal tech industry so Ooh. any of you uh legal nerds who are interested in a very cool e-discovery platform everlaw is the company for you we also have a referral bonus so it'll help me out if you uh let me refer you before you apply <laughs> <laughs> D Wong four sleeve. <laughs> the, <laughs> what is what does the web app do or the um, app? Uh, so this is used in the process of discovery, which is basically uh, this legal process where, uh, let's say you're suing some company for like price fixing. Uh, the courts could mm-hmm. mandate that the company hands over a bunch of emails, PDFs, PowerPoint presentations, anything that could potentially be related to this case, to price fixing. Mm-hmm. Um, so then, you know, your you as the law firm now have all of this data, these many gigabytes or in some cases terabytes, you know, multiple hard drives worth of data that uh, that this party has sent over to you. So what do you do? 
you, you know, how are you going to find things that are actually important that you can actually use? Uh, and an e-discovery platform is the answer. So we have a bunch of tools that let you search through this data. Uh, we have some AI tools where like after you've uh, told our algorithm which things are important and which things aren't important. We have an AI that goes through and scans the rest of your corpus. So, you know, the rest of all of those terabytes uh, and tells you like, okay, these things look important and these things look not important. And then you can really focus your time on things that are going to be high value rather than, you know, spending a bunch of time reading through people's automated emails, telling them they need to resubscribe to whatever and all this other junk that ends up in these collections. So do you have a history in law or did you have to learn about this when creating the app or how did this come about? Yeah, I have no history in law. Uh, I actually learned basically everything about this legal process at this job. <laughs> um, I'm, I was definitely more interested in the technology side because it is a very interesting problem when you have, you know, a massive amount of data that you want to search through very quickly, uh, find results basically as fast as Google. Um, <laughs> but for a, you know, very specific and curated, uh, search set. That's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Is there a piece of advice that you've gotten over the years that you feel has made the biggest difference to you? Ooh, a piece of advice that's made the biggest difference. Hmm. I need a second to think about this because I've definitely received a lot of advice over the years. Some of it's pretty good and some of it is not so good. <laughs> Truly. I feel like uh, probably the piece of advice that's resonated the most with me is acceptance, um, which is, you know, not to say that you can't improve things, um, not to say that, you know, you can't continue to make things better, but to accept things uh, for the way that they are in the present. Um, yeah, because, you know, it's, there are always things that are going to be frustrating that are going to bother you, you know, things aren't going to be perfect. Um but instead of letting that, you know, continue to bother you, continue to fester these negative emotions, having some kind of acceptance of like, you know, whatever it might be, whether it's things that I do frequently, like, oh, I just misplayed in this game, uh, you know, definitely played the wrong land here. Uh, or if it's, you know, things like, well, I don't appreciate my physical appearance right now or, you know, anything that could be weighing on your mind. Definitely what's helped me is uh, acceptance as that's that first step to just acknowledging like, yeah, this is the way that things are right now. Um, mm -hmm. From there, you can obviously go on to improve things. In you know, my case, it's okay, I've made a bad move. How can I mitigate this? How can I, you know, maybe win this game? And if I can't win this game, how can I make sure that I don't make this mistake again in the future? Uh, maybe if you don't like the way you look, okay, well, how can you change the way that you dress? How can you change the way you're, you know, taking care of yourself? Uh, Maybe, you, I don't know, get a haircut, do some makeup, get some jewelry. <laughs> I don't know. Um, get a personal know, trainer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hit the gym more. Like the first step is acceptance. Well, not and from actually there, hit the gym. <laughs> don't, don't actually go punch a gym. That that will not help your physical appearance. <laughs> Unless yeah, you want to look like a barroom brawler. Either. <laughs> <laughs> Just walk up to some guy named Jim. Just, uh, it's like, what? Yeah, someone do? told me to hit you. <laughs> <laughs> that that might be if i ever opened up like a, a a workout place i definitely would that would be the first shirt i would sell is just a cartoon character just punching a guy named jim <laughs> just no context no, no nothing else just that image and there's like only the cool people will know mm -hmm. do you have a do you have a favorite anecdote to tell given the opportunity oh boy this one's long so <laughs> buckle up uh, this is a story about a Magic the Gathering tournament that I went to in Toronto, Canada. Uh, so I'm from the Bay Area, from the San Francisco Bay Area. So uh, for those of you who don't know, the weather here is very moderate. Uh, we don't exactly have seasons. It's almost always just comfortable. Um, so I was going to this tournament in February, this tournament in Toronto, which is in Canada, which snows. And I forgot that it snows just you know, snow isn't a thing here, so I literally forgot that, oh yeah, sometimes when it rains, but it's too cold, it's actually ice that comes out of the sky. 
<laughs> so basically, uh, I just had, you know, my jeans, a t-shirt, and a hoodie just out in the snow mm. in Canada. Uh, <laughs> and I realized what a terrible mistake that I'd made. But uh, luckily, I was only freezing my butt off when I was going from the hotel to the Uber and then from the Uber to the convention center. Uh, luckily, the convention center has a heater, which obviously is necessary <laughs> in Canada. Uh, so I was, you know, able to play my Magic the Gathering in a comfortable environment. Um, and I actually did reasonably well at the tournament, uh, despite my, you know, poor decision making pre-tournament. Um, but one thing that was a little bit scary was that if I made top eight, I might have missed my flight. Because when I was booking my flight, I was assuming that I wouldn't do uh, that well at the tournament. These tournaments are typically like many hundreds or low thousands of people. So to make top eight, uh, even if you're very good at the game, which I'm, I'm okay, uh, it's, it's challenging, right, to do that mm -hmm. well in a field of that many people. Um, and then if you do make the top eight, that means you're spending some extra time at the tournament playing your last three rounds. Uh, but if you don't make top eight, then, you know, you're free to go, uh, go back home or just enjoy the city, do whatever. Uh, so I had booked my flight uh, from Toronto back home, assuming that I wasn't going to make it. You know, it's a reasonable assumption. Um, so, yeah, basically after the tournament finished, it was still kind of a tight ride just getting to the airport, not knowing if I was actually going to make the flight. Uh, luckily, it did get delayed by, I think, 30 minutes or something. And uh, the <laughs> the line for customs at Toronto, at the Toronto airport, was actually really long. Uh, it turns out that the Toronto airport is, I think it's a feeder airport is the term, where there's other smaller airports around, uh, where if you're going from, uh, you know, Canada to the United States or any other country, you need to go through customs. But those smaller airports are too small to have their own customs. So they go through customs at the main oh, Toronto no. airport. Oh, yeah, so this line was huge. It was like Disneyland, you know, doing that crazy S snaking thing back and <laughs> forth. But one thing that was really cool is I met uh, a magic celebrity named Dana Fisher. Uh, she was famous for being one of the youngest players at these tournaments. She was, I think, eight years old at the time. So I met her and her father, Adam, uh, in this line. They were in front of me. So we got to talk like four or five times as the line, you know, snaked back and forth. And then we met up somewhere in the middle. <laughs> 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 um, so we were both talking about how, you know, we were really worried about missing our connection and how this line was so long. It turns out we had the same connecting flight through Dallas, Fort Worth. So, uh, you know, we're all waiting at the terminal and, uh, the flight ended up getting delayed again. And now we're getting worried that we're not going to make our connections in Dallas. Um, so, you know, eventually we get onto the plane, we land in Dallas and everyone is real antsy because everyone's trying to get to their next flight. And the flight attendants are trying to keep everyone in control, you know, like, oh, please don't get up until the plane has come to a complete stop at the gate. But, you know, everyone just wants to grab their bags. <laughs> and when the first guy gets up to grab yeah. his bag, some other guy says, sit down, dipstick. And then the first guy responds, <laughs> I have three kids waiting for me in Colorado Springs. I am more important than you. And I was just like, okay, dude, calm down. <laughs> You can, you can grab your bag if you think it's that important. Um, but, I'm more important than you. <laughs> yeah, it was it was surreal just watching this unfold. Uh, but anyway, eventually everyone grabs their bags and gets off the plane. And for those of you who don't know, uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth airport is basically like a four-leaf clover, where every leaf of that clover is a terminal. Um, and these terminals are huge. Everything is bigger in Texas, as you know. Uh, so the fastest way to get from <laughs> where the plane landed to my next flight is to take the SkyTrain basically halfway around the airport. Uh, so I go up to the SkyTrain, yep. uh, you know, wait for the train, get on. There's a whole bunch of people on and, you know, they're slowly getting out uh, at their different stops to get to their different gates. And eventually everyone who's left are the people going to San Francisco. Um, so as soon as the, as the doors open, I'm sprinting out to my gate and all of these other people are basically <laughs> middle-aged businessmen. So I'm just like way faster than all of them. So I reach the gate and I'm completely out of breath and I just pant trying to ask the flight attendant, like, uh, is, uh, is the plane still here? And the dude's like, sorry, man, you just missed it. And oh, this was no. just, this was just really disappointing, but at least I had somewhere to run to. <laughs> very very sneaky mr wong very <laughs> sneaky i like this good thank you thank you <laughs> oh it's kind of interesting i had a flip-flop i had two different 
circumstances magic returning flight wise that are mimicked in your one story. So in, I think it was 2015, I was, I had gone to Vancouver and was returning after the Grand Prix and I didn't check my emails. This is a, this is a uh, lesson to be learned from folks at home. Mm -hmm. Check your emails that are sent from the, uh, (laughs) from whatever good and or terrible airline you've decided to purchase a flight from. Because in it, I believe it was United or Delta, had let me know, however ridiculously, that I needed to be at the airport two hours before my flight was set to board. Oh Not my God. leave, board. That's crazy. Yeah, I didn't look at that. Yeah, it's it's nuts and stupid. However, it is their policy, and I didn't look. So when I got to the airport with an hour left before the the plane was going to land they wouldn't even let me into customs let me let alone let me through customs what? so i had to change my flight to the next day ended up uh getting in late trying to get out of sfo and up back to um sonoma county where i lived at the time and it being a little too late and causing a work kerfuffle if you will yeah that sounds Cut crazy to, yeah it, it was it was nuts good very much recommend doing that although sleeping in the vancouver airport wasn't too bad. Terrific airport, albeit their policy, at least from United or Delta's perspective, is very stupid. Mm-hmm. So the next week, I went to uh, Grand Prix Miami, took a red eye, did the did the best flying experience I've ever had, where it was a red eye leaving at 11, a, or 11 p.m. SFO, landing in Miami, 8 a.m. their time with the first round starting at 10. So it's the perfect amount of time. Land, grab a bite, arrive in time to play Magic. Huzzah! Nice. I, As I'm getting on the plane, I, I buy a banana for like $5 at SFO, get two pints of Stella for probably like $80 or some ridiculous price, eat the banana, chug two pints of Stella, get on the plane, put on uh, some ridiculously expensive headphones that I returned shortly after this flight, listen to Jeff Bridges sleep tape. Yes, that's a real thing. And then passed out before the plane took off and woke up as it taxied on the runway. Wow. M- mission accomplished, challenge completed, whatever technical term there is for that. That is just on the, the way perfect back, experience. Oh, is the best. I, I've never been able to repeat, regardless of which ingredients I reassemble, I have not been able to repeat said triumph. <laughs> on the way back, I'm like, I get to the airport on time, and there's this problem with us leaving. Apparently, they since the flight is X amount of hours, they have to provide food for us. That is like legal law or whatever like that. We're like, okay, so we end up it takes a while to board and then we're sitting on the runway waiting for like the food packets or whatever that they're gonna charge us or give us for free or whatever. We wait, I think something like 45 minutes to an hour, which ends up making me late for the connection in Phoenix, which means I have to stay a night over in Phoenix, which happened to be not so bad because I had recently got fired. So ended up free night in Phoenix. Wasn't too bad. Didn't have to worry about being late to work or explaining myself. However, we've waited all this time. We get airborne. Oh, at least we're going to get food. Turns out they cannot serve you food in uh, continental flights after the hour of 9 p.m. And we pushed off from the runway at 9.01. So we waited an hour and 11 minutes for food that we could not be served. And then most people miss their connecting flight in Phoenix. That's completely ridiculous. <laughs> Didn't hear any, I'm more important than yous, but did get to hear the collective <laughs> groan of like 130 people or whatever fits on an airline. It was terrific. All right. Yeah. From planes, trains, and automobiles. Daniel Wong, what is your favorite little known factoid? Ooh, favorite little known factoid. Um, there's this thing called Simpsons Paradox. Uh, I can never really do a good job describing it, uh, but it's basically this mathematical phenomenon where uh, you can have a trend in separate groups of data, but that trend can disappear or even reverse when you're looking at the data as a whole. Uh, so one example is batting averages. It's actually possible for uh, player A to have a 
better batting average than player B in you know two consecutive years in 1995 and 1996. But when you, when you look at the total for those two years, it is possible for player B to have a higher batting average than player A, which just, that just blows my mind. That is insane. Wow. Now I... I want to look in. I, I now I'm going to have to look up the Simpsons paradox, and hopefully they have that example because I really want to see how that's possible. I'm sure it, it kind of sounds. The more I think about it for a second, it kind of sounds like, um, so sort of similar to uh, what is it? Um, what they do with like voting sectors or whatever, right? Um, oh yeah, gerrymandering. Gerrymandering, where you can have like by redrawing lines, you can actually change like averages. So that kind of reminds me of, I know they're not the same kind of thing, but it's like a fat, fantastic, like mathematical principle where it's like, even if, unless it's like completely lopsided and the whole entire state's blue, if, as long as there's, I think like 40 or 38% or something like that of a state being one way, you can gerrymander it to where it reads as if it is completely that way, like by voting district, because yeah, our system's antiquated as shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's just all sorts of crazy stuff you can do with statistics to, you know, make things look one way, even though they're actually very different. Um, yeah. It's yeah, all and, like applied perception, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you can, if you, if you give it a narrative and you craft it and, you know, you can, sometimes you don't even have to leave out information and sometimes it's just like, yeah, it's totally this way. It's like, well... It looks that way. <laughs> <laughs> True, yeah. Fill in the blank for me. This weekend was so great. I spent 13 hours... Playing Magic the Gathering. That is a good one. Would you prefer it be online, in person, big event, small event, just with uh, friends at a house? Or does it not matter at all? Uh, big event in person is my favorite. There's just something about like that energy at, you know, a big convention hall where there's, you know, the main tournament going on, a bunch of side events. There's like the people playing commander. There's the, uh, you know, different stores selling, buying cards, something about that energy. Just, I really enjoy. Um, totally. and also playing in the main event. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite? Oh, I am normal moment that you've had over the course of your life huh that's a really good question i feel like there have been a lot when i was younger but i haven't really thought about them recently all right well this one was from when i was very young you know back in my uh not understanding that harry potter was a work in progress stage um <laughs> i also didn't understand that uh people had medical problems so like i thought i was the only kid who had asthma for example. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I didn't realize that other kids had their own problems to deal with that, you know, I didn't, there were other kids with asthma. In fact, <laughs> I wasn't the only yeah. person for whom they designed an <laughs> inhaler. <laughs> but yeah, definitely you having that, that special. <laughs> yeah. Definitely having that realization uh, made me think like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I, you know, I am somewhat normal, you know, asthma isn't a, mm -hmm. every person has a thing, but there are a bunch of people with asthma and, you know, a uh, bunch of people with other medical conditions too. Everyone has their own issues that they're working through and that's totally normal. Yeah. Realizing you're not alone is a, like, it's a very weird feeling, right? Because at the same time, it's like, yay, I'm not alone. It's like, oh, also most of the time when you realize you're not alone, it's because it was something bad or that you wouldn't particularly <laughs> wish on somebody else. And then you're like, yay, you have asthma too. And they're like, I mean, I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> like they're not yeah. excited, to, the, like, <laughs> but it, it is very gratifying to know that other people are also afflicted. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's not like you <laughs> want these other people to have trouble breathing too, but it's nice to know. It's that, just that you, you know, don't want to be the only person afflicted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. What moment do you look back in your life with the most pride or joy? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, this is very recent. I just got married like a week and a half ago. Uh, oh, holy shit. <laughs> Mazel tov. I did not know yeah, that either. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it just <laughs> happened. Uh, but yeah, I got married to the love of my life. Her name is Linda. Um, awesome. And 
I am very confident that uh, that will continue to be one of the moments I look back on the proudest. That's uh, so awesome, man. Congratulations. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Now I feel like a jerk for not keeping up with as many people as I should. That's so... Con- <laughs> How did you guys man. meet, if you don't mind my burrowing? Uh, online dating. Yeah, it's the future. <laughs> it, it, I, I agree as much as I wish it wasn't, but those... Yeah. It, it's kind of interesting, right? Like looking at like old TV shows and seeing the amount of like, oh, I just settled up to your mom at a bar and introduced myself. It's like <laughs> nobody did that. Like if you talk to people from older generations, nobody did that. Mm-hmm. They got introduced by a friend. They went out a couple of days. Like it was only through like groups of friends, which people still do now to some extent. But it's like – or you can just have the internet effectively be your wingman and yeah. like <laughs> – like help you meet people in a not creepy or an endangering sort of way it's like yeah it's just so much better than like hanging out at a bar being a weird guy spending money on alcohol and going home depressed yeah for sure. and like not actually doing this like forlorn idea that has never actually existed that tv told us was a thing yeah it, it's also so nice that it does like the first round of you know making sure that you have at least some amount of shared interest so that you'll have some <laughs> yeah. compatibility Rather than just like an actual total stranger. Yeah, you're not just sitting at a movie that you liked and they probably don't. Just like laughing and they're just like, this is weird. And it's like leaving halfway through to get another drink and then not coming back. You're like, wait, what? Oh, yeah. I thought like, no, I didn't like, I don't, I don't like raunchy comedies. Didn't you read my bio? You have a bio? Like, yeah, it just like <laughs> goes cattywampus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For sure. All right. Lastly, before we throw it to our first commercial break, and I apologize profusely and offer Mr. Wong here a wedding present. If you could have listeners of this podcast hear one song of your choosing, which would it be? Oh, man. Um, I listen to a lot of video game soundtracks, and I feel like they're really underrated. Uh, and I also used to, pl- uh, used to play piano when I was younger. So whenever there's like a piano remix or even just a piano song in a game, which is very rare, I always appreciate it. So there's one song that I really like uh, from King of Hearts, and it's called Concert Paraphrase on Dearly Beloved. Highly recommend looking that up if you haven't heard it already. It's a beautiful rendition of the main title theme from Kingdom Hearts. That's awesome. All right. And with that, we're going to throw it to our first break feel free to stick around and enjoy this totally real commercial or take a minute to enjoy concert paraphrase on dearly beloved from kingdom hearts or if you really want to hear a song from a previous episode check out the playlist on spotify passionate people and preposterous peeves podcast song rex it's a long title i know don't worry there's a link in the description either way see you in a jiffy having trouble staying awake oh yeah Wish you'd followed your dream so you had the give a crap necessary to meet your deadlines? Oh, definitely. Are you likely to be fired the second another warm body walks through that door and asks your boss for an application? I mean, probably. Would you prefer to keep this shit sack of a job instead of explaining to Susan that you've been fired? I mean, I guess. Well then, let me introduce you to caffeine. Caffeine is a highly addictive substance that'll keep you jittery and energized to do any fucking stupid task for hours. Uh, that sounds like drugs. It is! Aren't drugs illegal? Not this one. So next time you feel like sitting on the sidewalk instead of at your desk, reach for a caffeine. Wait, you didn't tell me where I can buy it. Cause it's mother loving everywhere, you blind Neanderthal. Welcome back, folks. So, Daniel, what is your passion? My passion is competitive gaming. Uh, so primarily I play Magic the Gathering. I already gave you a few, uh, few stories, anecdotes, tales from, you know, playing Magic in the pre-COVID times. Um, but, uh, I also play several other competitive games. Uh, I used to try playing Super Smash Brothers, uh, both Melee and Ultimate. Um, who's your character du jour? Uh, in Melee, I play Peach using the Daisy skin. And in Ultimate, (laughs) I play Wii Fit. Would you play Peach if you couldn't use the Daisy skin? Oof. I mean, probably <laughs> I would need to find a new skin. I guess maybe the white dress. <laughs> but like, let's be real. Daisy skin is the best. So, Best. OP. Should get banned. <laughs> so what is it about gaming that really kind of revs your engine? 
Uh, for me, it's the competition. Uh, I think there are a lot of similarities between all these different competitive games, and also including uh, between some games that I you know don't play, like a lot of sports. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, very similar lessons to learn. Things like focus, things like not tilting when things aren't going your way, uh, things like dedication. <laughs> Uh, you know, really taking the time to learn how to wave dash, for example, is going to be important if you ever want to play in a yeah. melee tournament. <laughs> that might have been a, one of the many barriers to me getting into Smash. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like playing any game at a competitive level, any game, any sport, anything at that high of a level, uh, it takes a lot of effort. Um, and I think, you know, seeing the payoff of that effort is what I enjoy so much. Totally. Do you remember the first competitive game you like kind of got into? Uh, I do remember the first time I played in a tournament. I think I was less than 10 years old. It was at the Tech Museum in San Jose. I was playing Super Smash Brothers uh, Melee. And at this point, I had only played with my brother and friends. So obviously, I thought I was hot stuff being like a, you know, <laughs> eight-year-old, nine-year-old who can like beat his friends and smash. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go to this tournament and then like kick people's asses. Uh, mm -hmm. And I get there and I realize people are using the shield button, which is a button that I just had never pressed before <laughs> in my life. <laughs> Uh, and I remember that it's experience. Like the, it's like the break in a driving game. You're just like, what's this for? I don't understand. Yeah, like, why, why would you, you ever use you're it? You're trying to go forward. <laughs> why would you press the button that stops you from going forward? Right? <laughs> yeah, but I remember that experience being the moment when I realized, like, maybe I'm not as good at this as I thought. <laughs> um, and then definitely actually playing someone who is reasonably good at the game. I got destroyed. Uh, I think I cried a little bit, too, but... You know, that was my first foray <laughs> into competitive gaming. Um, I did get better than I was then. I started to use the shield button, started to learn how to dodge and roll, and eventually I learned how to wave dash. Um, and that's also where I uh, picked up my main, because one of the competitors there was playing Peach, and I didn't realize that you could use her float while you're on the ground. I thought you had to, like, float all the way to the top of her jump uh, in order to mm -hmm. actually float around. And seeing the the kinds of advanced techniques that these people were using was just like, oh man, that's so cool. I want to do that. <laughs> Excellent says inspiration. That's so mm -hmm. awesome. So that was your first time doing gaming. What? Okay. I, I, I'm going to go into a small diatribe because you just totally reminded me of like feeling like hot shit and then playing like it <laughs> in a tournament and like not understanding how cards worked. The first time I played an F and M I had come from playing like uh at a friend like kitchen table, like multiple times F and M for those of you not in the know is Friday night magic. It's the most common probably played experience outside of kitchen tables around the world. And I came there with this deck that I had created. Only problem was at this kitchen experience, which I'm sure is like many, we didn't understand apparently how to read. So multiple, not only myself, but one of the other players that was, I think like a cousin or a brother of one of the other players had cards in their deck that didn't work the way they intended. Like for instance, we thought pyrokinesis, which is a card in magic that deals damage to only creatures. We thought it dealt damage to players, making it considerably better than it was. Got informed that not only was that not a legal card in the format, but it also didn't work the way we thought. I had a card in my deck that I thought had a, a, let me see if I can use your word of the day correctly, ubiquitous effect. <laughs> However, it was only it was only a one-sided effect. The card was Tempting Worm, which I thought gave everybody oh. the advantage of putting all the creatures and lands from their hands into play. Very powerful effect in Magic. However, it only does it for your opponent, making it a very bad effect for you unless that card is very good and outshines all their creatures or they just don't have any. However, every time, <laughs> anytime I cast this, my opponent informed me how words worked, and I uh, learned that I was not very good, and that what I was doing was quite incorrect. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so similar to your, wait, why are they using shield? It's, wait, why am I the only play person playing these cards? Like, well, it's because these cards suck, and reading's apparently very hard, even though you're well into high school at this point. Yep. Yeah, I've definitely had my fair share of not reading cards as well. <laughs> reading's hard it really is 
so that was my first F and M. I think I was at the ripe age of fifteen. Yeah, fifteen. When did you play your first? Uh, when did you start first get, start getting into Magic? Uh, let's see. I think this was around twenty eleven or twenty twelve. Um, so it was basically uh, because I had injured myself. I had dislocated my shoulder. So my arm was in a sling, and I was looking for things to do while I was in a sling. So obviously nothing physical. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're going to rewind a bit. Oh, yeah, How yeah, yeah. did you injure yourself? Um, so the first time, it was in a high school uh, PE class. We were doing, I think, pickleball, which is basically tennis, but with a different kind of racket and a different ball. Um, and our teacher had us use our non-dominant hands. And what I didn't know is that my <laughs> joints are very loose. So when I swung the racket with my left hand, I swung it with so much force that apparently I just pulled my shoulder out of the socket. Uh, And then what I also didn't know is that I had dislocated my shoulder. It was really painful for like a (laughs) moment. And then it went back in Mm -hmm. and it stopped being painful. So I thought everything was fine. Um, But it turns out that after you dislocate your shoulder once, it weakens the shoulder so much that you're much more likely to dislocate it again. So... Uh, after yep. that, I think I was playing soccer and I did a slide landing on my shoulder or landing on my elbow rather, uh, and then dislocating my shoulder again. <laughs> and then after that, I needed to get surgery to, uh, you know, basically staple some ligaments together or whatever, make the shoulder stronger. Um, so while I was recovering from that, I was, you know, sitting around the house looking for things to do. Um, and then I believe that I first got into magic with the like, duels of the planeswalkers games i was playing on playstation but i know it was on xbox and steam Um, oh yeah you got like the get the little promos and all that stuff you're like it's just is it playing it's just playing versus computer right yeah uh that one i don't remember if you could even play online but i was primarily playing against the computer because that's what the game is set up for um Mm -hmm. but yeah i just thought it was really cool because i had played a bunch of other card games when i was growing up with my brother like uh pokemon Yu Gi Oh. we even played versus system for you uh card game nerds or superhero enthusiasts out there uh but yeah so having a card game like magic was really cool for me it felt very nostalgic um and so playing this jewels of the planeswalker game i wanted to you know keep playing because it was really cool so i looked up stores around me uh and i think the the set that was out at the time was M13. So mm-hmm. I decided to try doing a draft. And obviously my <laughs> card evaluation skill was very bad at the time. So, you know, I opened my pack and I'm like reading all the cards. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what's good. I'm going to take the rare. And the rare, <laughs> I forgot the name of it. It's like Diabolic Intent or something. It's like a, yeah. a five mana X tutor where you tutor X cards which is not very good and limited unless you can like actually get a boatload of mana and just put a boatload of cards in your hands. But I didn't realize that. I was thinking it has a gold set symbol. It has to be a good, good card, right? <laughs> so I'm pretty sure I passed the, like, you know, the actually good cards like Talran's Invocation to make two 2-2 two, two flyers for four <laughs> mana or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, so even though I lost horrifically, I still had a fun time. <laughs> That's awesome. So you said... It sounds like you're one of the rare people that actually knows how to play Pokemon, which is fascinating. Mm-hmm. But when did you? What were the? When was the first card game that you played? Uh, that one was definitely Pokemon. Uh, so you know, my brother and I were super young when Pokemon got big in what was it, ninety six or ninety seven or whatever. Um, yeah, ninety seven. Yeah, so we both got the base set of Pokemon cards, opened some booster packs, made some you know crappy decks out of whatever cards we got. Uh, and I think we maybe got a starter deck or something because I remember there being a rule book and one of those coins. Because there's a lot of coin flipping in the Pokemon card game. Um, <laughs> uh, but then there was also a Game Boy Color game. Uh, oh, I think it was yes. just called Pokemon TCG or something. But yeah, the the Game Boy Color game is literally just you're playing basically the Pokemon equivalent of Yugi. Just this card game protagonist <laughs> fighting a whole bunch of other people in the Pokemon TCG. Um, so I definitely learned a lot of the rules from that as well. But yeah, my brother and I would just play our decks against each other, flip coins, scuff up our, you know, otherwise <laughs> mint uh, Charizards and all that good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. So you said that you were playing soccer. Did you play any like competitive sports 
like growing up through like high school or was it almost all just like intramural and like PE? It was mostly just that like intramural or like the, you know, youth uh, basketball league, soccer league stuff. Um, I was never especially good at sports. I'm pretty small and there's just a lot of sports where being bigger helps you. So I was just naturally at a disadvantage for a lot of these sports. Uh, so I never really got into any sports competitively, but I did play a lot of them from, you know, these random leagues or from a PE class in school or things like that, or, you know, just playing with friends. That's really cool. Do you, do you still play to this day or is that as most of that, like kind of like competitive edge transferred mostly to playing like magic? Uh, it's definitely mostly in magic now. Uh, part of it being, even after shoulder surgery, my shoulder is never going to be 100%. I'm always going to be more likely than the average person to injure myself again. So there's just a lot of things that I can't do safely, even though they are fun. Uh, so, you know, I'll still like shoot a basketball around with my friends, but I, I can't really uh, go hard and like actually try to play a competitive <laughs> yeah. basketball game without risking injuring myself again. So kind of unfortunate. Mm. Yeah. Would you say, what would you say is the biggest misconception about competitive gaming by the wider world? The biggest misconception about competitive gaming? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't usually think too hard about how competitive gaming is perceived. I guess, uh, in a way, a lot of non-sports are viewed as less than sports. Uh, in particular, I think this happens when you're talking about esports, you know, just a lot of uh, competitive video games, where... You know, there are people who compare these esports to traditional physical sports. Um, and I do think there are many similarities. You know, the top level competitors need to spend the vast majority of their time prepping for their game, right? That's what any mm -hmm. athlete's going to do. That's what any, you know, top League of Legends or Dota player is going to do. Um, so, yeah, I think there are just a lot more similarities between these things than the average person gives them credit for. Basically, yeah, I feel so like you're... competitive games should be more respected on on par <laughs> with actual sports, even though they are different. Yeah, it, it's it, it is kind of interesting looking at, especially when like nobody makes fun of chess champions. Not anymore. It's not like the '80s or anything like that. But like mm -hmm. in the current day and age, people look at chess champions and they're revered. But if you look at like a Dota player or like a League of Legends player or even Magic players that have accomplished great things, they definitely don't get the same level of reverence. Mm -hmm. Do you think some of that has to do with the money that's involved or do you think it's mostly the fact that like it's card games and computer games versus something that has a lot more grandeur like chess? Yeah, I think that grandeur is definitely a part of it. Uh, one big thing chess has going for it is, you know, it's been the same game for I don't even know how many hundreds or thousands of years or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But then, you know, uh, card games like Magic are constantly evolving as, the, you know, the company associated with them releases new cards. Uh, League of Legends keeps releasing new champions. So, like, these games keep evolving. And I feel like that stability for sports, right? It's like the rules are always going to be mostly the same. Like, yeah, the leagues can change minor details about the sport, but, you know, football is always going to be football. Basketball is always going to be basketball. Chess is always going to be chess. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that kind of stability has some effect on the way that these uh, competitions are perceived. But yeah, I, I do think that the grandeur is definitely another part of it. I feel like there's just a lot more people who have heard of these sports than there are people who have heard of, you know, competitive League of Legends or competitive Magic. Yeah, so like the the name recognition, it's kind of like, do you want to go to mom and pop shop or do you want to go to like Sonic or do you want to go to like Wendy's or something like that? It's like, exactly. oh, I know what Wendy's is. I know what I'm expecting. Like it or not, I, I can understand it. And it's not like this unknown. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like, oh, it's, you know, magic. It's like, what? Is there <laughs> yeah. a non? Sorry. Oh, I was okay. just agreeing with you. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> is there a non-obvious aspect about competitive gaming that really kind of you know lights your candle a non-obvious aspect um i do think that there are a lot of benefits to the attitude towards uh competition that you can apply to other parts in your life um primarily i think a lot of what i've gained is uh not tilting which tilting i think is a term that comes from poker it's when you make it 
Oh, sorry. It, it comes. It it comes. It comes from poker, but before that, it came from pinball. Oh, that makes so much more sense. Right? Tilting's an actual <laughs> thing in pinball. Okay, yeah, I was confused yeah. about why <laughs> tilting is a poker thing, but uh, yeah. No, they stole it from a. Uh, they, they stole it from pinball. It's it, it is really weird and fascinating. It's like because it, it did. Uh, luckily for me, in this circumstance, I'm from the world of poker. I've been a poker dealer for going on 15 years, and that wow. always fascinated me. And there was some uppity know it all, you know, mid 30s schmuck that was just like actually like pushed his glasses up actually it's from it's from pitball and like went off on some <laughs> tirade while everybody else just looked at the ceiling in angst <laughs> okay well today i learned <laughs> but anyway yeah the the concept of not tilting which uh so tilting yep. is when you make some kind of mistake and then you get flustered and you know continue to play poorly to make mistakes and then the cycle just continues uh things continue to just go downhill um so definitely learning to connecting back with what i said before accept the mistake that you've made and then move on from it right to recover the best you can um and even if you can't recover in that particular game in that particular instance you can always learn from it yeah it's that's one of those things that it, it took me a while to learn. And it's, it's something to, because the way I initially react, and I think the way a lot of other people initially react to is you make a mistake and you're like, shoot, I shouldn't have made that. And then mm-hmm. instead of looking re like kind of recalibrating your decision point to be from where you are now moving forward, you keep looking back at where you should have been. Like, oh, I should have had an extra card. My opponent should be at less life. You know, I should have paid my taxes on time. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have said this thing. It's like, yeah, that's a good thing to remember for next time. But for the now of the decision you are about to make, only look at it from the circumstance you are currently in. It's like, what would you do exactly in this moment? Mm -hmm. Yes, obviously, you don't want to get into this moment. You don't want to make this mistake. However, this is where you are. And all you can do is move from where you are. And so like mm-hmm. you're saying, accepting your circumstance and, you know, deciding where to go from it and not looking at not dialing, you know, kind of revving your own tilt engine up and being like, well, I should have. It's like, it doesn't matter what you should have. It matters where you are and what exactly. you do from this point. It's all you can do. Yeah. It a very... feels... But yeah, no, this ahead, is please. kind of an oddly Zen philosophy in a way of, you know, the past is the past and all you can affect is the present and the future. So you need to think about... Yeah the now and not fixate on the man i just messed up uh because Mm -hmm. that's in the past now exactly yeah that's that's a really good one to learn it was interesting when you talked about when i initially asked you the question you were talking about how that you were able to take life lessons from magic and this is a very good one but it reminded me of how i got through my econ class which I've only taken one of, and it was introduction to econ. So definitely isn't facilitating at such a high level, but the, <laughs> I was able to pass my econ class just from understanding uh, resource management from playing magic, which is really <laughs> fascinating. Wow. That's this is awesome. like, yeah, they were talking about like mutually beneficial exchange. It's like, yeah, no. So you trade your premium removal spell for their premium threat. And everybody's like, okay, cool. He got, he pathed. Like the one player that destroyed the Tarmogoyf is excited that they destroyed the Tarmogoyf. The other guy was like, Hey, I needed a land. Thank you for casting Path to Exile. I'm letting me search for a basic. <laughs> and like, there's, it, it's really weird, but like, once you're able to, and n- not to, you know, pump up and say that it's the greatest game of all time, but I kind of do think Magic is the greatest game of all time. And it's because of these circumstances that are only found in life and predominantly in games that are either Magic or like trying to replicate like some of the majesty that is magic because it is so encompassing, Mm -hmm. you know, learning about Zen, learning about basic econ turn or like econ principles and stuff like that. There are so many different life lessons to be taken from any game really, but especially this one when like, if you boil it down to its, you know, kind of bare bones and then extrapolate from the, like the general principle. Yeah, for sure. Man. All right. Now that we've gilded that, Sorry, go. Oh, I, I still can't get over the fact that you're using these principles in an econ class. That's so funny. <laughs> it was it was pretty awesome. It was it was very satisfying to just like 
Okay, understood mutually beneficial exchange. And then it was like, um, it was like the idea of using your resources, uh, like maximizing resource use. I was like, oh, totally. Like they're talking about like each term you want to be doing this with your financial. I'm like, yeah, you want to tap your mana every turn. Yeah, that's mana efficiency. To, like, <laughs> yeah, it's mana <laughs> efficiency. That's all it is. And I was just like, wow, I'm understanding this class way too well for not understanding this class. This is, <laughs> this is fascinating. <laughs> it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's get away from gilding the magical lily and on to the obnoxiously preposterous. Daniel, what? is your preposterous peeve today? Oh man. Uh, For me, I think it's when I'm watching someone else play a game and watching them make mistakes, but not being able to do anything about it. Uh, So usually that's, you know, because I'm watching someone like play at a Grand Prix or some other competitive event where you as a spectator are obviously not allowed to interfere with the match. Um, But there's something about like being a spectator that makes it so much easier to see all of these like best plays to make and whatever and then watching someone just completely miss it and do something (laughs) terrible is just it's so painful (laughs) totally do you is that something that's always been a problem for you when it comes to gaming has it like always been you know even when you were playing pokemon like with your brother and like playing smash like and like trying to play like a couple tournaments and stuff like that was that always kind of a thing for you or is it only when you got like really good at magic that you really started to have that like kind of side creep up? I feel like it's mostly as I had started to get better at things because it is definitely different when I'm like playing and my opponent is making mistakes (laughs) because then, you know, (laughs) depending on the situation, if it's competitive, I'm just glad that I'm, you know, getting these free advantages. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But yeah, I think it's like as I matured and understood more of the strategy behind these games, that I'm more able to see like, oh, okay, this is a really good play to make for, you know, X, Y, Z reasons. Um, Mm -hmm. But then, you know, reaching that understanding and not being able to help someone who is not making those plays and instead like, you know, using their removal on terrible creatures or, you know, just doing something not good. (laughs) It's always just so painful. Does this extrapolate into life too? When you like, you get a text from a friend about making a kind of like a bad life decision. Does this also kind of, do you immediately want to like call them and be like, no, don't do that stupid thing. Like this movie sucks. Or like <laughs> that person's weird and creepy. Like, is that, oh, yeah, is that the sure. kind of similar reaction? If, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Like, you know, that feeling where, you know, one of your friends is like dating someone who's obviously not the right person for them and has some kind of, some kind of weird, <laughs> maybe creepy stuff going on. But like they're your friend and you don't really want to say anything and you definitely don't want to badmouth their significant other in front of them. But like, (laughs) uh, I don't know, like maybe you should sit down with them. I don't know. (laughs) Uh, That's hilarious. So we were talking on one of the breaks about how your uh, new wife that sounds weird. Your current <laughs> wife, your beloved. I don't know how to say this without sounding like you killed somebody and buried them. <laughs> how the love of your life plays magic as well, but not at quite a competitive uh, grade. Mm-hmm. When you're playing with her or you're like watching her play, if she's playing online or playing against another friend, do you find yourself... Is it easier? Is it harder? Do you even look at it the same way as you would another match when it comes to like wanting to correct their play or tell them to do something better? Uh, This I feel like when the stakes are lower, then I can kind of dial that back because, you know, when you're just playing Mm -hmm. with friends, you're playing casually, then it doesn't really matter if you're making mistakes. And if you're not like actively trying to improve, right, if you're not aiming to be a top competitor in this thing then you don't even necessarily need to learn about your mistake in that game. So I can definitely yeah. turn it off in those kinds of situations where, uh, you know, everything's just for fun. Uh, so it doesn't doesn't really matter if you're making optimal plays. Um, but then, like, yeah, in a like competitive a, scene, it, yeah. Yeah. 
It's like a casual date, right? Mm-hmm. It's if somebody said, I think I'm going to marry this person and they're awful for them. You're like, oh, I should say something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like, now, I'm just going to go have drinks. They're just like kind of fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, I'm just going to have drinks with this guy. I don't, I don't think I like him that much, but you know, whatever. I said, we'd go on a second date. You're like, all right, whatever. It's fine. Yeah, you know, exactly, like, exactly. you're not making any yeah, the stakes lasting are lower bad there. decisions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's sure. just lemonade. It's not beer. Nothing bad can happen. <laughs> yeah. All right, and with that absurd analogy, we're going to head to our second ad break, but don't go anywhere, because when we get back, Daniel is going to enter the lightning round. See you in a bit. Can't wait. Have you ever wanted to kill a small woodland creature or break a window but not had the physical strength? I know I have. Now introducing Rock. Rock comes in a variation of sizes and ready to use. Simply put Rock in your hand, raise it back to ear level, and release. See? You've got it. This ad does not condone the violence against small woodland creatures or windows, nor will it be held liable for any inability of use when coming into contact with paper. And we are back. Daniel, are you ready to enter the... Lightning round? I sure am. All right. Put however much time it takes to bake this cookie on the clock. Daniel, is there a god? No. Shakira's voice in Danny DeVito's body or Danny DeVito's voice in Shakira's body? Uh, Shakira's voice, DeVito's body. Have you ever paid more for a meal than you made in a week? Uh, When I wasn't working, yes. (laughs) You're having the best day of your life. What happens next? Another amazing thing or something terrible? Just keeps getting better. Would you rather give up cheese or naps? Cheese. Are hot dogs sandwiches? Yes. No one's looking. Do you put the cart back or leave it in the parking lot? Put it back every time. If you had the power to see the future but couldn't change it, would you use it? Yes. Pineapple on pizza or fist fight? Pineapple on pizza. Kill the spider or get an adult? Get an adult. Is there a price for you to give up your passion forever? Yes. It's very high. (laughs) Kanye. Yes. Which one of your parents settled? Neither. Which do you max out first? Intelligence, charisma, or strength? Intelligence. Did you ever cheat on a test in school? No. Tacos or burritos? Tacos. Are we alone in the universe? No. Would you rather have your inner monologue sound like Gilbert Gottfried or Fran Drescher? Fran Drescher. Are cheese its addicting? Oh, yeah. Lions, tigers, or bears? Bears. Would you rather be 10 minutes late for everything or 20 minutes early for everything? 20 minutes early. Are you happy with your life right now? Yeah. Make the food or do the dishes? Make the food. Are you a squid or a kid? Squid. Is Marvel overrated? No. Do you call it a baritone or a euphonium? Baritone. Congratulations! You've survived the lightning round. What lightning round question would you like to ask me and in turn be asked a future guest? Uh, would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? 100 duck-sized horses? Yeah, same. I mean, they'd be cute so I wouldn't want to fight them. But the idea of fighting a horse-sized duck is just, that's nightmare fuel right there. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine how big that beak would be? I, I just don't want to hear the timbre of the rock <laughs> that would be coming for me before I turned around. So, <sighs> Yeah. All right. As we come to the end, is there anything that you want to plug, recommend, places people can find you or your content? Uh, yes, I play Magic on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, Daniel Wong Quad Sleeve Guy. Awesome. Well, thank you for being my guest today, Dan. Thanks so much and for special having me. And special thanks I... to my editor, Richard Ash. <laughs> and special thanks to my Redditor. La, la. Right, we're going to just <laughs> start from the top. <laughs> Well, thank you, Daniel, for being my guest today. And special thanks to my editor, Richard Ashford, and my composer, Joshua Gibbons. Thanks for and having me. And especially thank you, every. Sorry. 
<laughs> my pleasure. <laughs> now I feel like you're just doing it on purpose. <laughs> I thought you were done. <laughs> and especially thank you, everybody listening at home or wherever you found time to appreciate this. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, listen, please subscribe, like, or just share it with a friend. Every little bit helps. Or if you already have and are out of episodes to listen to, don't worry. We put out a new episode every Monday at midnight on SoundCloud, YouTube, and Spotify at Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves Podcast. And a very special thanks are due to our first Patreon patron, Sabella Yellow. And if you would like to join said ranks of awesomeness, feel free to head on over to patreon.com backslash passionate people and preposterous peeves podcast. And remember folks, water rains, kings rain, but when I put a bit in your mouth and call you my steed, you say it's just weird. Laters.